Hello, hi everyone. I'm Poser. I'm E. Fawn of Traditional Asian Art at Asia Society in New York. And now she, um, we also would have with us Alice Wong, Executive Director of Asia Society, got it, got started on her career. And for inviting me, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, I was not, um, although I, I grew up in a family that uh, training as an art historian uh, for most of my undergraduate career, and in fact, in la Chinese language and literature courses. And at Donghai, um, we had a and traveling into New York with my parents. You know, I remember going to have that calligraphy course um, really you know, that, that you're working within this very limited and brush. And, um, and I realized also how, how challenged, um, you know, I took my first two and by, and our degree in what at that for foreigners, this was in 1985 that I was, um, I studied with, the uh, of, uh, foreigners from, from Japan and from, um, and it was a really, really, there was great camaraderie. It was good for, you know, kind of developing my eye, not just for calligraphy for a year and um, was accepted at, uh, in a PhD program at Columbia, uh, who, uh, who then uh, became Marilyn Wong Gleistein. Background, um, you know, is really in, in, in Chinese academia, or I was going to go into the museum world, but and um, I did some teaching and I did some volunteering. Uh, an organization, an uh, Asian um, Arts and Culture University, and then I got my first job at a at a museum at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, actually working in an education department. I was um, I, I got the the museum had gotten a. a the edge and uh, it was um, a, a two-year position and um, that's how I really got and I think that for me as a as a curator um, that provided me with a really really strong foundation um, for who I am um, you know we, we end up with this very kind of myopic um, way of looking at art and uh, being forced to essentially go into the galleries, train docents, and also work with the public, art looks like from the perspective of somebody who has no background in Asian art. I mean, I'm, you know, of course, I'm talking about about an American audience, and I work with an American audience, um, educating them about a Asia and Asian Asian art, and and they're in in the East Asian art department at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, kind of information I put into, into my labels and, and didactics and the other kinds of educational materials I put together um, with, with the exhibition. You know, people who know nothing, people who know something, um, and people who know a lot. And um, I, think, I think there's a way, way to do that so that it's, it's accessible to, to everybody. Um, and um, I was in Philadelphia for seven years. And then I had the opportunity to, um, to apply for the job at Asia Society, um, job at Asia Society in, in 2004. So that's sort of the, the quick and dirty First one is that um, you were at Asia Society for 16 years. Can you talk about the Rockefeller Collection and the various... About working with, at Asia Society in New York um, and with, collection off, you know, with, with kind of creme de la creme, um, you know, classic examples of uh, Asian art from, from across. Um, so I had to really think of creative ways to, to work with that collection over the course of time. Some of the exhibitions that I did were very, um, uh, more or less straightforward exhibitions like um, Chinese ceramics and um, looking at, at them uh, design with some symbolic um, um, implications and also just uh, the notion first under heaven, which was looking at, at Korean ceramics um, in the, that, that tradition. 
But um, hey, so I did a show called Collector's Choice where we invited um, a number of uh, from their own collections and put them into conversation and and the exhibition factors um, and why they chose the objects that, that they chose. Um, the 50th anniversary of Asia Society, uh, Asai, who was our president at the time at, at Asia Society show, um, I found a number of, of objects from different generations of Rockefeller families and other siblings and brought them all together. Uh, but it also highlighted John D. Rockefeller III, the founder of, of Asia Society, and Blanchett Hooker Rockefeller, his wife, who, who um, you know, formed this, this important collection at, at Asia Society. Um, as part of that gala, oh, the two um, were discussing of this exhibition called Transforming Minds, um, Buddhism and Art um, came together uh, for contemporary, modern contemporary Asian art at Asia's so conversation um, between spectacular um, Buddhist works from the Rockefeller collection oh, and, and Melissa um, selected a number of people pieces by Michael Ju and Zhang Huan and um, Mariko Mori and Montan Bunma. And um, I think that it worked um, incredibly well in the Hong Kong Center space, um, which has kind of natural divisions and it allowed for, we installed things. So in most cases, the contemporary and the traditional objects were in separate areas, but you could see a across um, um, the conversations that were, were happening. He called Space Baby or um, Buddha Obfuscatis, um, which um, combined one of our, uh, uh, one of our traditional um, Gandharan helmet around the sculpture. And um, you could see multiple views of, of this Buddha. And um, it was a really, you know, for me, um, there were sort of modern take on what one thinks of as a thousand Buddhas or, um, you know, sort of a, a you know, a universal um, Buddha. Um, and, I, and I think that, I mean, I well to it. I think it engaged, you know, older people and younger people um, and was really, really successful. And it was a really um, fun show to go left. Um, my a uh, colleague or former colleague, Michelle Yun, started Asia Society and uh, using um, works from, they were all works from the collection at Asia Society, contemporary pieces in the collection as well. So we were able to put, um, again, um, pieces of work from the collection that were a little bit frustrating when I go to museums and I, I see works of contemporary art just or a bunch of traditional objects where when there's no you know there's no real real connection with it but but we've um collected some pieces about um pieces like particularly like um uh, we have a, a beautiful koetsu hand scroll um um that um is um i think it's life gets life um, which is um, in Chinese or in Chinese or Japanese um, that um, starts to turn as beautiful and poetic. And the Koetsu hand scroll, you know, is also calligraphy um, and, and um, poems about these traditions of artists working together with, with um, traditional forms. But for me, those are, those are the most interesting and the most um, fun kinds of projects to work on. So um, you talked about how the examples of bridging traditional with um, contemporary. Um, can you give us like, other examples of how you were able to reach, you know, um, an audience? Yeah, um, I sort of try to do it um, in in all my my shows. I mean, one show that that um, that for me holds a really special place is is um, the show that I did on pilgrimage and and Buddhist art. 
Um, and that was that was an exhibition by experiences I had um, as a child and in my youth. And the 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 the, the childhood experience was actually being in in Mexico City and seeing. Um, uh, pilgrims go to visit the crawl, you know, basically uh, crawl up the, the stairs on their knees um, to the cathedral. And I was really, I was really struck by that kind of level of devotion. And um, much later during the time that I lived in China, I went to Tibet and um, I saw a similar kind of devotion happening at, you know, a number of different temples, but in particular, you know, pilgrims coming into Lhasa to circumambulate the Potala, um, you know, basically um, prostrating themselves and coming up, getting up again. And, and um, I, I think that that experience really got me thinking. Of, and I realized that, um, that this could be quite a popular show because a lot of people can can relate to it, no matter what their religious background or, or um, you know, their, their countries of origins. Uh, and um, so I I used that pilgrimage that I doubt Buddhism, and then um, the the, ex the way I organized the exhibition was that was as if it was a kind of journey that you were moving through, you know, starting at at one place in the more enlightened state. Um, and I think that that allowed people from from all different kinds of, to understand the the um, the message, the object, um, um, the practice of Buddhism um, and pilgrimage in Buddhism, because there are, you know, there are obviously pilgrimage sites that are universal to all Buddhists, but then within each ones have kind of cross-pollinated with the Buddhist tradition in special ways. Um, I think that gives a little bit of a sense of the kind of thing. The most popular show, the most visited, was that one of them? And whatever was the most visited show, would you say that was your favorite or was it just, it, was a, it came as a surprise to you that it was the most visited? Um, hmm, most visited. I mean, the the um, the pilgrimage show um, did, did another show that I worked on with uh, guest curator Nancy Tignley called The Ancient Arts of Vietnam. Um, was a really fabulous time to to the United States um, and historical works and um, you know objects that um, so that was great but you know I, I was you know in terms of favorite Juan's kind of situation because whatever I work on you know as you work on even if even sometimes you know sometimes I, I was given projects to work on it, but as I, you know, the more time I spend with them, uh, you can't, I can't help but become devoted to them and fall in love with them the more I learn about them. I mean, for me, um, there are two shows that, that really um, uh, are good, good examples, two of my favorites. I mean, I, you know, as I said, I, I love them all. One of them um, was a 2014 exhibition that I worked on with um, with Olaf uh, Chaya um, called the Golden Visions of Dentis Densitil, a uh, Tibetan um, Buddhist monastery. And um, what what I really love about that exhibition is um, this and these 14th, particularly 14th, 15th um, century sculptures that were. Um, part of these special kinds of stupas called Pashi Gomang um, that, that were in this uh, monastery in Densitil. And um, during the Cultural Revolution, those um, Tashi Gomang were completely taken apart. They were, um, their, their guilt and, um, and those pieces had been um, although they were meant to be destroyed, a lot of them ended up being dispersed um, in um, other places in the world. And um, and Olaf had done a lot of research. So, with with, it, with the, what we tried to do with the exhibition was to gather as many of these pieces as we could find back together, and then drawing form 
um, through the like and what it would look like. This exhibition that had these spectacular sculptures, the most spectacular. And the installation, we worked with uh, a designer that I, um, just beautiful um, exhibition design and all of these components I think came together to make a really, really compelling show. Um, so it was spectacular visually, but it was all um, we the first of its kind in the U.S., an um, uh, exhibition on the density material. It was. It was the first of its kind. Um, and I, I, as far as I know, it's the first of its kind in, in the world. Um, uh, there was just a lot of interest in, in, the, in the catalog um, through, throughout the world, including in, in China. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I mean, that was really exciting to be a part of. And... Um, and in a way, a similar, I mean, I think that for me, I really, I, I really like shows that are really, you know, they don't have to be very big, but um, was the Philippine, um, mm. what we call Philippine gold treasures from Forgotten Kingdoms. And um, while the scholarship for that show in terms of, you know, the world, because um, because a lot of that material came from the Ayala Museum and it's displayed at the Ayala Museum. Um, the, the pieces, uh, these pieces of, of 10th to 13th century gold are just jaw, draw, jaw dropping, stunning in terms of the technology used to produce them um, and the size and the quantity. Uh, but most, most Americans, including um, Filipino Americans, know nothing about this material. This material was um, was just a really, really great, um, you know, great experience, and I think a really important contribution. Um, and for me, that show also um, was gave us an opportunity to highlight something else that I think is always important and that's showing the um, the interconnections between cultures because that gold is not only spectacular because of all the gold but because of because the these technologies show connections with with China with India with other Southeast Asian countries you know at this really early stage and highlight how important the um, you know, that seafaring exchanges and um, all of those types of, of, of issues that um, have been so important to the, the growth and transformation of, of art and art history, you know, throughout the world. Can I, um, this is Alice, I wanna cut in here because there was a question here from our online audience. Uh, who uh, I visited the Philippine Gold Treasure of uh, Forgotten Kingdom exhibition back in 2015. It was beautiful. So uh, the um, the idea of doing an exhibition on the Philippine gold um, came came to us from from the Ayala Museum. They approached us, and um, and we started to to have a conver conversation about that. I um, specifically met with uh, Nina Capistrano Baker, who is a consulting curator at Regal uh, Board, and um, and that's we we started to to um, discuss what was in the uh, in the collections. We um, talked about whether there were supplemental things that could be added to the show. Uh, opportunity to actually go and see the material. I mean, it's 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 difficult to 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 um, organize and and how it can be displayed. So um, um, we were very fortunate in in that I was able to go to the at the Ayala Museum, go to the Banco Central, see what what was there as well. And then to start to think about um, the checklist, uh, Nina came up with an, um, you know, it was it was largely Nina's checklist. And then we, um, you know, with a few supplements here and there, 
Um, and then we also realized that um, in conversation with Nina, that there was a really, these gold pieces um, that would be really great to have for the exhibition. So then, then I worked um, to get them on board with, with I always, um, once Clay has, has an idea about the exhibition, I kind of leave him on his own to, to be creative. And then he comes up with um, ideas for installations based on sections that I've thought about. Nina and I thought about the different sections for the, for the exhibition. Um, he came back to us with with a kind of really um, cool ideas for double sided cases for displaying, you know, some of these massive pieces of, of gold um, that that made, you know, really highlighted. Um, how spectacular the pieces were. And um, so often, you know, when I'm working with, with a guest curator, like I did in this case with Nina, it's very much a, a conversation uh, between the, the two and, and really balancing. I really wanna, I want the curator to um, be able to have a very strong voice. And I'm, I'm there just to sort of help, help guide um, the outside curator. Um, to think about how to think about our, our audiences and also to offer suggested objects or to, to talk about objects. So usually the guest curator will also write um, uh, or often write the didactics uh, or I will write the didactics right, based on um, existing, the was working on, on the, the content. Uh, we worked on it together and then came up with, with something that we were really satisfied with um, together. Okay. Should I now? Is there another? Yvonne? Uh, so you worked on uh, mon uh, a monastery material. So at Walter's Museum, a uh, Walter's Art Museum, do you think you would be able to do the same or what are your plans for the future? Um, so Walter's will be a little bit, a little bit different um, set of challenges. Um, the the um, Asian collection at the Walter's has about 9,000 objects. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, a lot of a lot of things to become familiar with, and a lot of things that I'm sure can be worked with and researched in a new kind of way. Um, it's the Walters has has a um, a world class and really renowned conservation department, and I'm really excited to in the collection. I mean, I haven't. I still, you know, I haven't, I haven't technically started the job yet. I don't, I don't start until um, the, the 30th of, or the 31st of, of, uh, of May. Um, so as I dive into the collection, start to get to know things better, I'll be developing uh, projects. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll be working on is working with the other curators there to do a big reinstallation of of the Asian collection. Um, so the Asian uh, collections are, are going to move to a, a different space. And um, the plan is to um, create a new kind of narrative and new kinds of conversations uh, and highlights um, in that display. Puts me, uh, gives me the opportunity to play more of a, a mentorship role, um, working with other members of the, of the staff. As, as you both know, at Age of Society, we only had two curators. Um, so, and I, and I think that at this stage in my career, having done so many, um, so many international loan exhibitions, uh, so many, um, so many different kinds of installations. Uh, it's really, it's really time for me to share my knowledge, uh, and I look forward than just Asia because I think that those conversations that that you can have as an art historian, as a curator, with curators from completely different areas can can be really stimulating and um, give you the opportunity to think about 
about art and, and new kind. Of, um, those are all things uh, that I'm, I'm going to be doing doing at the Walters, and that I'm I'm looking 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 forward to. Um, you know, to, to have new challenges is something that's that's really important to me, and I good time for for a change for me, and I'm I'm really excited about it. So uh, I think you were working on a show at Asia Society called Comparative Hell, and it was supposed to yes. open in September, and now it's been postponed. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about this exhibition and whether or not you'll still be working on it now that sure. you're starting at Walters and at the end of this month? Yeah, yeah so Comparative Hell um, is, is my baby that I've been working on for. Um, for quite an age of society this this fall, but due to um, everything that's been going on with um, the spread of COVID and so on, um, it's had to be postponed, and um, it's currently postponed until the spring of 2022. Uh, the catalog content uh, essentially is complete, mm -hmm. um, and the checklist, you know, obviously is also is also complete. Um, so, and on top of that, we, we, we just received a government grant. Um, so, um, I'm really, um, you know, extremely hopeful that, you know, things will s steam along, you know, and in, in 2022, um, the exhibition will, will happen as we, we had planned. Um, I hope to be involved. As, as a guest curator, that since most of the heavy lifting has been been done at this point, um, you know, I'm I'm so attached to the show, and since it's my concept and and all of that, um, I you know I really hope to be able to to continue to be engaged with it. But obviously, I have to balance uh, my responsibilities at the Walters um, with. You know my my activities with relay in relation to to this this uh, hell exhibition, but my plan is to to continue to be involved. So, so what type of objects um, and material is going to be in what's supposed is supposed to be in this exhibition, or is it a so? Yeah, um, yeah, it's um it's another pan Asian exhibition, and um, the uh, I'm uh, it's primarily focused on. Uh, Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, and Islamic uh, works of art. The reason that that those those particular religions are represented is because those are are the religious traditions that have um, produced um, the most the most hell imagery. Um, and this shows a little bit like pilgrimage in that you know I think that hell is hell is a is a concept that almost everybody has been exposed to, but I think a lot of um, a lot of Americans are not aware that there are very robust hell traditions um, in in these you know in in Asia, and um, and it's a really great opportunity to to show the kind of um, works that were that. Uh, hell inspired, you know, across Asia. So there are there are pieces in the show like um, we have one of the um, three kings of hell um, hand scrolls uh, that came from Dunhuang. That's from the um, from the you now in the collection of the British Library. Uh, we have. Uh, a number of Jane, Jane manuscripts that um, that show punishment in hell. Um, we we have um, uh, some some hin Hindu paintings that that show um, the 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 travels in hell of. Uh, important uh, characters from the Mahabharata um, and uh, all kinds of Buddhist uh, images of, of um, wonderful characters like the, the hell courtesan who wore these 
uh, is might have been a, a historical person who who um, wore these robes showing showing images of hell on them, and there um, she's uh, represented in a lot of paintings and, and prints. Um, so the or, the exhibition is organized um, with a section that situates hell, and then there's a section on judgment, there's a section on punishment, and there's a section on on salvation. So it's it's kind of taking you through um, uh, a kind of a kind of travel as well as you move through the exhibition. And these are, you know, I mean, what I think what's really kind of com compelling and or one of the things that's compelling and interesting about the subject matter is that that there 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 are quite a number of similarities um, among the types of imagery and the imagery that one sees in the, in the Christian tradition, um, in the depictions of hell and the types of punishment. And, and for me, um, you know, this relationship um, between, um, you know, the, the idea of hell and attempts to, um, kind of control human behavior and human interaction um, are quite interesting. And it's, it's you know, quite fascinating to see how, how it plays out throughout history um, in many different cultures and, and, and countries and in different religious systems as well. Um, we have now, we're gonna start we have quite a few questions from the online audience. And uh, uh, one of them is you had mentioned earlier that you're, really, you're looking forward to playing a mentor role at Walters. Um, this question asks, what is something that you wish you had known about before beginning your career as a curator? Huh. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I think that I, I always, uh, you know, I knew that curatorial work was was interactive work, um, and one of the things that I really um, love about about this job is that I get to work with so many different people. But uh, I I wish that I had. I think it would have been helpful um, to ha have a a better sense of of how um, you know how how much um, flexibility and w one needs to to be able to work with so many different types of people on, on so many different levels um, and I, I think that that something else that I really would have liked to have known is that I think when you start out as a curator, especially when you're a, at an assistant curator level, there's, you know, of course you're, you always want to, um, you know, you want to become a full curator and you're frustrated because you don't have as much control as you would like to over exhibition concept and that, that, that kind of thing. But at the same time, um, some of the most interesting and fun work you'll ever do is when you're um, when you're at that level because that's when you you actually really get to have you really have the time to dive in, into the into the research um, because often what you're doing as an assistant curator is kind of creating a lot of the depth of content for the person who's who's you know who's who's perhaps created that concept, but but needs help because they're doing so many other kinds of administrative things. And, and being a curator involves a lot of administrative work. I mean, it's not, you know, people picture curatorial work as being sort of this, oh, you get to just, you know, you're spending, spending your time with objects and looking at objects and, and um, uh, you know, going to these glamorous parties and, yeah, there, there's some of that, but but the more majority of time is spent with your computer and and doing a lot of sort of mundane kind of stuff. So I would say to people who are starting out, really appreciate and enjoy that time that you have to to um, to work in depth with with objects. 
um, and, and to work with people, you know, go in, you know, if you want to go into this field, recognize that um, you need to have a sense of humor um, and you need to, um, you know, do, do your best to find ways to work with all different kinds of, of personalities because it's not always easy. Um, but, you know, I always say to myself, you know, it's, yeah, okay, you know, back up, okay. You know, it's, it's only art, you know, it's not life and death. You can be in really, really stressful situations in this job, um, um, you know, especially in working in this field. I mean, we didn't really get to talk about difficult shows, but, you know, there, there, there are thing, elements that you will never have any control over, you know, things that are going on politically. Um, you know, you may not be able to control some of the people that you're working with. Um, it's really important to be able to kind of step back and breathe. And, you know, in, in the end, you know, things get delayed sometimes or, um, you know, there, there are difficult situations, but you have to be able to kind of step back, breathe, you know, let it go when it's possible and not get completely overwhelmed by it. I mean, in the end, you know, for me, it's about creating, it's not about me, it's about creating a uh, you know, a, a product that, um, you know, that other people are going to enjoy. You know, I always try to keep the ultimate goal, you know, the audience and how that's going to impact the audience. You know, how is this, you know, I, I want to be able to create things that are going to be new for the field and that hopefully will have longevity past, um, past the time of the actual ex exhibition, because these are, you know, these are, it's a lot of work and they cost a lot of money. And, um, and, and I think it's important to be responsible with that kind of, you know, when you have that kind of opportunity uh, and, you know, you're, you're working with that kind of a situation. Well, speaking of uh, lack of control, uh, with the museum world right now and globally, uh, the museum world, uh, most where you are, I know Asia Society is close and, and, and I believe Walters is as well. That's right. And yeah. Here in New York, many of the museums are going to be closed until probably August or September. Um, mm -hmm. What are some ways um, you as a curator are exploring um, or will be exploring for individual to enjoy an immersive um, cultural experience. And right now we're all talking about experiences. I mean, in some ways with this lockdown, it's made us appreciate um, museums even more, but how are you, uh, you know, as a curator gonna bring yeah. it? Yeah, um, so I can talk about this a little bit in terms of, of Asia society. Um, because Asia Society closed down, you know, right, you know, right towards towards more sort of the beginning middle of an exhibition that I had just opened um, called The Art of Impermanence, um, which uh, was an exhibition uh, that, that included works from, again, the, the Rockefeller collection, but also from the collection of John C. Weber, all Japanese artworks. And, um, exploring the idea of impermanence, uh, ironically. And, um, and it was a beautiful show with lots of beautiful objects. And I know that there were a lot of people who hadn't seen the show yet. And it was, it was really frustrating to have that show close early after all the work that went into the exhibition and the catalog and all of that. And when things closed up, we started to talk about whether or not there was a way to do some kind of a, um, a virtual tour of, of the exhibition. And we were really fortunate in that we had, um, we had a few different components that existed. I had, I had, um, we had done ex installation photography, which we always do to document our exhibitions. Fortunately it was done. We had stills of all the objects in the show. And I had also put together an audio tour for the exhibition. We, uh, at Asia Society, we 
that we write or they write um, their own audio tours. And the audio audio tours that that I've I write, I always write as if um, the person who's listening to the audio tour isn't reading anything else. So it's kind of its own little story in itself. And um, Asia Society has a very talented um, video videographer um, uh, who um, was able to bring all these components together, you know, working in conjunction with him, we were able to create a, a virtual tour that that works really well. Um, so, so that at least, you know, I felt like, well, here, here's this, here's this tour of people who haven't seen the show before at least can go through this tour and get sort of a sense of what the exhibition looked like. And we can, you know, we can sort of preserve it in, in that way and have it for perpetuity um, for people. So, so that's, the, that's the kind of thing that we, we were doing. Um, you know, we've, uh, the, um, the team at, at Asia Society, the, the PR and marketing people, um, the web team um, have all been also working on um, creating, um, you know, Instagram posts and, uh blogs and um things like that that relate to objects in the collection so that they they keep people engaged with with the collection as well yeah well we're running um i think it's 10 30 uh it's exact an hour uh and uh, i want to take this opportunity as the executive director of asia society hong kong to thank adriana and also Yifan for co-hosting this uh, program with us and also to pay a tribute to Adriana. Uh, because of the shutdown, I know your colleagues in New York really didn't get a chance to say goodbye to you after 16 years uh, at Asia Society. And I'm so honored that we have the opportunity to have you here uh, tonight, this morning in New York to, to pay tribute. It's been, it was a great pleasure working. Uh, I remember our inaugural exhibition, uh, Transforming Mind, Buddhism Art was still one of the show that people still talk about eight years later. And I look forward to future opportunity of working with you. Uh, and, uh, and we have done that also with Milwaukee as well. And uh, because I think uh, the, the partnership, the, what you have brought to Asia Society is something that uh, we will you know, always remember. And we wanna wish you best of luck in Baltimore at Walters and, uh, and wish you stay healthy and have a, you know, uh, and look forward to welcome back to uh, Hong Kong at any time. I'm sure you'll be making trips here. And, uh, and again, thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for our first, uh, what we hope to do uh, with everybody kind of sitting at home, locked down, and in some ways, um, we want to talk to other curators. So uh, hoping uh, with a partnership with uh, Yifan and Orientation, uh, we want to have this curator to curator or a curator discussion with other curators around the world. Uh, and uh, and also really providing the information. And uh, as everybody knows, Hong Kong's art scene, arts and cultural scene is growing with, um, with uh, M Plus, uh, Palace Museum coming up and um, some of the or institution. Museum of Art has reopened. And uh, so I know uh, many of the young people here in, in Hong Kong and Asia are looking into uh, the field of uh, curation. And so we, we look forward to be able to provide that platform of uh, educational platform to share. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. You're all good night. Good night.